maybe before we really dig deep, um, I researched you, of course, to prepare for all of this, um, but maybe some of our readers or listeners um, don't know you that well. Um, so maybe you can just give us one, two sentences um, about who you are and, and what your journey has been so far. Yeah, I joke to people that I've been selling since I was six because I was the kid that used to do the magic shows. Um, I, I was a terrible magician, but I actually... <laughs> loved performing. And um, in order to perform, I needed to sell. So I'd go door to door to door to door and I'd invite all the kids on the block to my magic shows and then puppet shows. And um, I've just always loved people. I went to college at the University of Colorado and thought I would go into law and took a year off, which at first horrified my father. Um, <laughs> Um, and ended up answering an ad in the paper, and it was a sales job. I thought it was a glamorous concierge job <laughs> in the mountains of Vail, Colorado. Because, <laughs> yeah, and, and it ended up being, um, once I took the job, it ended up, I was the one who would stand in front of the grocery store at 22 years old <laughs> and invite people in for a timeshare presentation. And oh. uh, that was my first job I ever had. Um, <laughs> pardon? Not glamorous at all. <laughs> no, well, but actually, I joke about it, but it was really fun. Um, I realized I love talking to people. I love meeting people. And then ultimately, I, I got into sales. But, you know, it sort of was a paradigm shift for me because I thought, you know, when I grew up, you were going to be a doctor, a lawyer, or marry one, right? Like in, in my world. And uh, I thought, wow, you can actually get paid doing this. And then um, as things progressed, I ended up meeting an amazing mentor who changed my life and really helped me to see that there was a process to this thing called sales and that um, it was really about connecting with other humans and building relationship and how do you do that and how do you dig deep and find out who they are and what kind of attributes do you need, curiosity and kindness and empathy and and I started to become a better person and my relationships in my life got even better. And I thought, this is amazing. It, selling isn't pushing a product. Selling is building relationships. And gosh, this was 30 years ago. And some of the people I sold to very early on are still mm -hmm. friends. So um, yeah, so I had a wonderful experience. I um, became a VP of sales about 20, 25 years ago. And and led large sales teams uh, in, you know, in, in a couple of different locations. And, but my dream uh, was always to start my own training company. And so in 1997, I did that. Um, we founded Leviton Group. And uh, at that time, my goal was to really bring this heartfelt approach to the world of selling because there were a lot of high pressure salespeople, there still are, or, or people that just don't think about, um, you know, how to really connect. They're just sort of pushing a product and, and they're not thinking about the human aspect of it. Uh, but started the company in 97, within five years, we went global, had offices in Europe and India, and I got to travel the world as a young 30 something. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, it's been an incredible journey with certainly some failures along the way that we can talk about, um, you know, and uh, I, I always tell people, you're gonna fail. I, I live in Park City, Utah, and I ski, and if you um, don't fall down, you're not skiing hard enough, and it's the same in sales. If you don't fall down as an entrepreneur, as a leader, as a seller, you're just not working hard enough. The idea is you can lose the deal, just don't ever lose the lesson. Hmm. learn from it, move on, get better. You've got to continually get better and stronger and brighter. Uh, and then you, the sky's the limit in sales. And, and that's why I love it so much. Awesome. I will definitely get back to the fails. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will. <laughs> I love the part about the magician. One of our founders actually is a professionally trained magician. <laughs> no, really? Yeah, he is. <laughs> See, magicians are interesting to me because they're really, you talk, they're, they're mesmerizing the audience and getting you to look in a different, the whole thing fascinates me. A good magician is awesome. 
perfect. Um, okay, then let's get really started. Let's get um, down to the sales part. Um, so I read, according to a HubSpot survey, 97% um, of people distrust salespeople. Why do you think it's like that? Why do you think <laughs> well, big distrust in sales? Yeah, in fact, I read a Gallup report, Veronica, that said that salespeople are the least trusted of all professionals, second only to politicians. Now, you're in Germany, I'm in the US. So in our political landscape, <laughs> it, it's not just even a distrust of salespeople, it's a distrust of information. Mm -hmm. It's a distrust, um, you know, we, we, you could say that it's the fault of social media if anybody's seen the social dilemma, but I think that social media just expedited um, what's already there. Um, if we're going to get to to salespeople in particular, um, you know, it it can be the same in in any profession, but but in sales, um, there are certainly a lot of great sellers, and then there's a lot of sellers that do either don't have the education or quite frankly, they're lazy. I call it sales hell. We, we sort of default into these bad behaviors out of habit, ego, laziness, or lack of knowledge. And, yeah. and you can kind of sum it up that way. I talk about that in my book. But I think re really the, the biggest reason is it's either laziness or, or a lack of knowledge. And, and what happens is, you know, particularly with now the internet and social media, it's really easy to just automate emails. And, and hope something sticks, you know, it's that spray and pray mentality, instead of really doing your homework. I mean, you got to do two things today when you're prospecting and, and, you know, trying to meet with a customer, I call it show me, you know, me and solve to involve. So before I ever reach out to anybody or before anybody ever reaches out to somebody, for God's sakes, look them up on LinkedIn. Um, if, if you're selling, you know, B2B, it, it, you know, there, there are so many resources for you to look somebody up, find that commonality, let them know you care. This is, this is no different than what we used to do without the internet. You make it about them. I tell my son, be interested, not interesting. Make it about them. Show me you know me. Um, the second thing is you've got to solve to involve. Uh, the last thing you want to do is talk about your state-of-the-art platform. I mean, I go to my LinkedIn messages I think I got 25 in the last two days, someone wanting me to, you know, set up an appointment with them or look at their state. I'm not looking for a state of the art platform. I'm not looking for a solution. You, you know, I don't care that you're number one on the planet. And then I wonder why the heck haven't I heard of you if you're number one on the planet. Nobody cares. What they care is what they, you can do for me. Now, on the other hand, I've had people who really do their homework. Hey, Sherry, in chapter five of your book, you talk about such and such. You know, we have a lot of other, you know, coaches and training companies we work with that, you know, are suffering from this problem. Is that something that you suffer from? Because I noticed in one of your blogs, wow, now I might talk to you because you made it about me, right? So, so sales reps have a bad reputation because they're lazy, they don't do the work, or they just don't know how. And as leaders, we need to give them that education and that training and that process um, so that they can make it very specific to the customer in front of them. And, and with all the noise today on the internet, I always tell people, you know, you don't even have to have a better product, but you do have to be different and you do have to show me you know me. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think there are also people that see differently. I just read a LinkedIn post actually today uh, this guy said, okay, it's creepy. Like this hyper personalization, it's creepy for the people. It's like if you go to a date and you'd be like, so, hey, how was your vacation in 2017 in Thailand? And you're like, okay, wow, that's, that's creepy. You shouldn't tell that. And he compared it to sa sales and said, okay, in sales, it's also creepy if you go there and be like, hey, um, let's say on your blog post three months ago, um, you wrote the X, Y. Um, where do you think is like, is there a thin line between like being personal and being creepy? Or it's do you- great, It's a great question, Veronica. And I think it's like anything else. It all starts with intent and transparency. Mm -hmm. If I'm not stalking you for some nefarious reason, 
I, I just tell people like it is. I, I remember I, I tell a story uh, in my seminars about uh, an incident where my husband absolutely swore he wasn't going to buy a car. Um, <laughs> we, we, we were going down to the car dealership, but he looks at me on the way down and he says, listen, whatever the guy says, we're not buying anything today. I'm like, fine, it's your car. Like, no, no, you're emotional. I know how you are. We get down to this car dealership and the sales guy comes out, silver haired guy. And he looks, takes one look at my husband. He says, Lee Gerstein, I am delighted to meet you. I hope you don't mind, but I did look you up on LinkedIn. Why? Because I like to know a little bit about the people I'm going to serve so I can give you the best possible service. He says, also, if you don't mind, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart from all, for all the volunteer work you do for kids with autism. He said, my own child has autism. And I got to tell you the connection that happened for the next 30 minutes talking about autism, talking about cures. My husband takes a look at me and he says, I think he has what we need here today. We hadn't even looked at a car, right? But, but again, he set it up correctly. Yeah. And, and I just think you got to tell people. I had a conversation with a gentleman last night. I said, Mike, um, I hope you don't mind. I was so excited to meet you. We have so many mutual friends. I looked on your LinkedIn and I saw that you love animals and you work for the Humane Society um, and that you have 10 dogs. And then I held up my own dog and it was like magic. So I think, you know, I, I don't find it creepy. Maybe somebody else does. I guess if you're using it and you don't really authentically care, um, I authentically care. And yeah. if you don't authentically care, you have no business being in sales. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, totally agree. I think especially with the whole pandemic going on at the beginning of the year, like everyone was talking about, yeah, you have to sell with empathy now because you don't know in what situation the people are. Did they, is their company... Um, do they have struggles? Did they lose their job or their family members? Um, but I had the feeling all the change was that people started the email with a sentence like, I hope this email finds you in good health or something oh like God. that. Oh God, don't, don't even get me started, right? This generic, I, I hope you're okay during these uncertain times. Yeah, it's like, exactly. <laughs> it got to be spammy, right? Yeah. It was spammy. Then that was all the empathy and all the personal message people put into the outreach. Like, um, so it's that, but that's contrived empathy, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Automate, let's call it automated empathy. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, how do you in like do you have a tip for everyone? Like, how to show real, honest empathy in such an envi environment without being like, yeah sound automated? You know, um, I don't know if you've ever read any Brene Brown. Have you ever followed Brene Brown? She's no. um, very popular in the United States. She's an author, not in sales, but she talks about vulnerability. And um, she's brilliant. And one of the things she says, uh, she says many things that I love, but, you know, she says that, um, Sorry, I just literally lost my train of thought. <laughs> what does Brene Brown say? Oh, um, you know, so what, one of the things Brene Brown says uh, is she says, we can't have two versions of ourselves. So you don't have an at work version of yourself and an at home version of yourself, particularly when we're working out of our homes, right? So you think about it, people always say, well, how do you cultivate true empathy? when you don't feel like it. Because let's face it, you're on eight Zoom calls a day. It's like, oh God, I like really don't even care. <laughs> but I am a firm believer, if you think about it, feelings create actions, right? If I'm, you know, have a certain feeling of love or of empathy, I'm gonna have a certain action. But the opposite is also true. Actions create feelings. And you can't have two versions of yourself. So if I'm, at home and I want to cultivate my empathy at work, hey, guess what? Let's start at home. Yeah. Let's start listening to our children better. Let's start listening to our spouses better. 
Um, let's start being more curious. Let's start when we go to the grocery store with our masks on, actually looking in the eye of the person that's bagging our groceries and saying, hey, how are you doing? What are you doing for the holidays? Are you like, you've got to practice empathy in every aspect of your life. How, how do I practice empathy? You, like, you, how can I train it? You, you practice it by doing it. You take more time to find out about every human that's in front of you and you listen. And, and it, again, it's like anything else. It would be like saying, how do you learn to play the clarinet? You practice. Empathy can be practiced. And the more you practice it, the more you will cultivate. So if I want to become a kinder person, I practice kindness. Um, I have been, particularly this time of year, saying, you know what, I am going to reach out to three people I haven't talked to in a year that I just like for no reason other than to just see how they're doing. When the pandemic hit um, in March, April, when we realized, oh my God, we're like really on lockdown, yeah. um, we lost half our business. I'm a keynote speaker. A lot of our revenue comes from doing big sales kickoffs. So anything that wasn't closed, canceled. And so our team got together and we panicked a little bit. And we said, oh my God, how are we going to replace all that revenue? Now, thankfully, one of the guys on my team said, I think we're asking the wrong question. Sherry, you taught us this. So I'm like, oh God, it's great when you forget your own training, right? One of your employees goes, uh, no, it's not about us. The right question is, we need to go to our customers and say, how can we help you without needing anything in return right now? That's empathy. Awesome. That's saying, I am going to call them with no ulterior motive. And we did. And, we, and then we did a series of four hour, hour and a half sessions. We brought in um, Jill Conrath. Uh, to speak, David Brock, a gentleman named David Garrison, to talk about how to deal with the fear of the pandemic, how to manage your own emotional state. I interviewed Colleen Stanley for a, a LinkedIn Live, and we just did all of these free sessions, and we had almost 500 people show up. And then we started calling customers one by one. How can we help you? Can we do a lunch and learn? We won't even charge you. You've been our customer and our friend. Within 90 days, we had more business during the pandemic than we had the entire year before. Awesome. We need more we companies with like empathy. That. Huh? We need more companies like that. It's like, it's about helping customers and not about like selling. Selling sounds so negative. Um, it's really, it's helping. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, I have the feeling um, the pressure is too high in sales. Like, Imagine you're an SDR sitting in, let's say, a 300 um, company, 300 man company, and you have to hit your numbers. They say, okay, you have to book that many meetings. You have to close that many sales. Like it's extremely high pressure. Like you have to do mass outreach to actually be able to hit those numbers. How is it possible to combine those two worlds, being empathetic and helping customers and hitting your numbers? You know, if you figure that out, <laughs> yeah, you know, um, there's not a magic pill for that. I believe, um, again, it, it depends on the situation. It depends on the product you're selling. It depends on the technology you have, but it really starts with your mindset. That's where it all begins. And, um, I would always rather make less calls and less outreaches that are higher quality calls and outreaches. And that's the advice I would give to an SDR. But like I said, it really starts with your mindset and your ability to have high productivity too. See, I don't believe people run out of time. Everybody, oh, I don't have any time. No, you don't have energy. You, you're, you ran out of energy. You did not run out of time. We all have the same amount of time in a day. You know, um, Benioff, Elon Musk, uh, the late Steve Jobs, they had the same amount of time that we did. Are you managing your energy and your productivity? And I am a firm believer um, in 
taking time off. Um, every morning I, I do a little bit of yoga, meditation. I work out every day. I either run or I go for a hike. I tell my team the same. If you need to leave at noon, go to a yoga class, whatever you need to do. We need to feel good to do good. Um, you, you know, you think about what you're putting into your brain. A lot of people in the United States during this election got completely addicted to the news 24 seven. Well, okay, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm saying, look at where you're spending your time. Um, and, you know, we're, we're better off reading than we are watching Netflix. I watch Netflix, but it, it's hard to have an on off switch today. Um, if you think about it, um, I grew up in the 60s and the 70s. And in the 60s and 70s, we'd watch a TV show and it had a discreet beginning and a discreet end. It would be a 30 minute or a 60 minute show. Well, today, you, the internet doesn't turn off. And anything you wanna read, do, watch, find out about is on there and we get into a rabbit hole. I, I say resist the rabbit hole because if you really stop and look how much time you're spending and are addicted to social <laughs> media, you, you know, pick up your phone. Well, here's a tip, pick up your phone and look where you're spending your time. But before you pick up your phone, guess, how much time did I spend on Instagram? How much time did I spend on TikTok? How, and you will be shocked. Do yeah. it with your teenagers and it's even more shocking. They have no idea. Yeah, it's like I have the iPhone and it always says, okay, you've spent that much time on your phone this week. And every, at the end of the week, I get a summary. Be like, okay, your average time on your phone per day was, I know, two hours, 46 minutes. That was 42% higher than the week before. And it's always it's really shocking and i wonder like that's so much time every day i could do so much more productive stuff in those two and a half hours every day um yeah it's and, and that's the habit piece when I, mean, I was talking about what are these default behaviors um a lot of times sales reps know what, or leaders know what to do they've read it they've heard it but they don't do it hmm. um, it's this knowing and doing gap i know what i'm supposed to do but I don't, why? And if you think about that, one of four things is happening. It's habit, which is what the phone is. It's a habit. I hear the ding, I hear the like, and I go to it. Turn off your notifications when you're prospecting. Get it, wait. you want a, like a usable tip? Turn off your LinkedIn notifications, turn off your phone notifications, or you will get distracted. Neuroscientists tell us there is no such thing as multitasking, it doesn't, exist. You are going from task to task to task and you lose your productivity when you go task to task to task. But we've all become ADD, you, you know, um, um, because of the addiction. And look, that, that's by nature. If you think about what is what do Facebook and what, what do all of these social media companies sell, that they're, they're vying for our attention. And that is a limited resource. And so if you're finding it hard to get it all done and you're stressed, that's the first place I would look. And I'm not saying don't do it, but make it a reward. From six o'clock to seven o'clock, I'm going to play around on my social media and I'm going to have a great time. But what you say then, the sales management, sales leadership mentality has to change. Like that they actually offer the room for every rep to... Um, personalize the sales that they say okay let's not focus on the numbers too much of course there are some numbers we have to hit um, but we give you the room it's not like you have to send that many emails and make that many calls um, the quality is what we take care of and that you have the energy um, that you make really good relationships with your customers so is it then a management problem I mean, look, um, the statistics are, are obvious, right, um, about I think that one of the biggest crimes, and we just created a frontline management online course, a little self-promotion there, um, <laughs> but uh, b because one of the biggest challenges is that, look, what happens in the training and coaching process is duplicated in the sales process. Mm -hmm. So if, uh, if our frontline managers are just saying, you know, I call it um, checking on instead of checking in. Um, if you're checking, you know, checking on sounds like, hey, how come you didn't meet, meet your quota? Hey, what's going on? Or are you leading with empathy? 
with your sales team? Are you getting to know, you know, we, we created for our clients 14 get to know you questions. So before we ever even talk about business, are we taking the time to get to know someone's inner world so we can affect their outer world? Because if I don't know what's important to you, Veronica, if I don't know that what you really want is to one day go to architectural school or one day you really want a great cabin in the woods or you want to go out on your own, if I don't know what drives you, how can I motivate you? And how do I expect you to have that behavior with my customers? Right? How do I do that? So asking questions like, this is a great one. So here's a great tip if you're a manager. I love asking reps, SDRs, account execs, whatever. If you had an extra $5,000 a month, what would you do with it? And you've got to go and ask that question three or four times. And then what? And then what? Because a lot of times you'll get sort of this first level answer of, uh, I put it in the bank. Great. Then what? And they may never even have thought of that. Oh, I'd, um, I'd save up for my retirement. And then what? What would you do when you retire? Oh, well, you know what we've always wanted to do is buy an RV and just drive around the country and meet people and see the world. Now I got why. Now I've got something. You know, I, I like to ask people, there's a great um, question uh, from Tim Ferriss. And he says, if you could have a billboard that had any quote or phrase on it and you could shout it out to the world, what would it be? And you'll find out what's important to that person. But until we do that, and then we need to ask management questions. We need to ask questions like, how can I hold you accountable without micromanaging you? What's the best way to do that? How would you like me to approach you if and when I feel like you're not doing all you can do? Like have those conversations as managers today need to be coaches. And so when you ask that question, um, we can't possibly expect our reps to lead with empathy if we don't do it with them. What would be on your billboard? <laughs> be kind for everyone is fighting a great battle. Awesome. Love it, Shari. Um, I know the, you always say salespeople have to find a balance between heart and sell. Um, I love this expression. I think it's great. Can you maybe explain exactly what you mean with that? Yeah, you know, I find um, we, we actually have a quiz that we do. I can give it to you for your show notes. It's called yeah. the Tony and Susie quiz. And I jokingly, but there are no jokes be, because <laughs> I find it all the time, talk about the two different types of sellers. And these will sound familiar to your listeners. And, and you might even put yourself in a category. Susie is super sweet. She's lovely. Everybody loves Susie. And actually, Susie's incredible at building relationships. You ask her for something, she always over delivers. Um, she wants to get to know you. She actually does know your kids' names, your dog's name. You're like, you know, and the customers love Susie so much, they like invite her over for dinner, right? So she's great at building rapport. But when it comes to actually asking the difficult courage questions, you know, like, why wouldn't you just implement this yourself? Or um, what other vendors are you talking to? Or saying, okay, are we ready to sign up? Are you the decision maker? All those questions. Susie doesn't want to interfere with the relationship. I have a gal. I love her. She's a Susie. She works for me. We were going to put her in sales and we went, we can't. Because she's <laughs> such a Susie. She says to me the other day, and I love her. She says, oh, I can't invite Mike for another meeting he's my friend. I'm like, wait a minute, we can't sell to friends? You don't believe in the product? No, I just don't want to get in the way of the relationship. That's a Susie. I think That's I'm a Susie too, yeah. That's why I'm in marketing and not in sales. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but then you got Tony, okay? And Tony is a closer. You know, Tony's going to get the deal. And and the, the I joke about Tony that the customer says, um, you know, do you... 
you know, how long is your implementation cycle? And Tony says, well, how long does it need to be for you to want to buy from me today? <laughs> you know, it's like, Tony, stop. <laughs> Tony's got too much courage. He doesn't know how to build the relationship. He's the one that uses all the automation. Um, and, you know, Tony's a closer. And of course, you want to find the balance between the two. I call it respectful assertiveness. And you want to know how to build that relationship. And really, I hate the term overcoming objections because what you want to do is lead people and help them decide how to decide throughout the entire sales cycle. And I'm talking more about AEs here, obviously, than SDRs, people that are taking it all the way through. But, but you, you really want want to be able to balance the two. And, and look, it's art and it's science. It's both. Because there is neuroscience to how people buy and you need to understand that. We need to understand how the brain works. But there's also, it's an art. Yeah. And I forget it all the time. You know, I'll go, oh, I was such a Tony. I was such a Susie. You know, but, you know, because you, if you're good, you go back and forth. But it's important to have that distinction, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm saying now, um, I would say I'm a Susie. Um, let's say I'm in sales. I know I'm a Susie. Um, how can I switch it off? How can I show more courage? Like courage. Courage, yeah. Well, let's get back to Brene Brown because I love this. If you look at the word courage at the Latin roots, C-O-U-R actually comes from the word heart. Mm -hmm. so if you have enough heart if you care enough about your customers you care enough about your family you'll have the courage to ask the difficult questions so here's what i would say to susie first of all um structure is important you've got to have a, a, a sales cadence a sales process that you follow um that you know where you um really craft your questions in advance you really craft your pre-call plan and you've got verifiers and a process for moving your customers through the pipeline. That takes the emotion out of it a little bit, right? So that would be step number one. I talk about in chapter three that there's freedom in structure. Um, a lot of people think structure, you, you know, limits them, but it actually frees you up to, to follow a certain cadence in a certain process. Um, I also talk a lot about that, you know, I, I don't know if it was Mark Twain who said this, but it's action cures fear. And if you're having a hard time mustering up the courage, I advise this, and it's scary. First of all, write down and try this at home if you're listening to this. I, it's amazing exercise. Write down, what's the worst thing that could happen? Like, <laughs> truly. like really? Are you going to get humiliated and, and put on national TV as, oh, <laughs> she asked a bad sales question. You know, she, she was to it. Like, what really? Like, what's the worst thing that can happen? You might be embarrassed. Um, you, you, you might feel ashamed. Because I can tell you, once you write down the worst thing that can happen and you look back, the only difference between a salesperson that's 10 times more successful than you is they've just heard no more times. They've gotten more comfortable with the word no. That's all. <laughs> you know, didn't they say that the Beatles um, were told for years um, that their music would never sell? I think Decca Recording said to them, ah, nobody wants that kind of music. <laughs> it's persistence. It's, pers it's tenacity. And, and, and yeah, you got to believe in your product. If you don't believe in your product, you're selling the wrong thing, but, but it is. And, and so one of the other things, after you've made that list of what's the worst thing that can happen, here's the hard part. <laughs> Write down the 10 things or the 10 people that you could contact that are most scary to you, like that really freak you out. And you can even do this in a relationship. What's that relationship that you sort of burned or isn't going well, but if you could go back to that person and have the courage to say, I'm sorry, or to listen to their side, it would make a big difference in your life. Like write that down and do it. What's the worst thing that can happen? Uh, miracles happen when you get out of your comfort zone. 
miracles. It's hard. If it were easy, everybody would do it. But that's why the rewards are so great. And, and you, you know, I, I try to take stock every year of exactly that. And, and, and sometimes it's really scary. Or, or who's that one person that I want help from that I really look up to that if I could get an hour of their time or if I could learn something from them, it would change my life. Didn't you and I meet through Jill Conrad? Yeah, exactly. Okay, I'm going to tell you a good story about Jill. So um, I think it was about five years ago I started reading Jill's books. And she's such a great author. Have you read her books? Yes. You, you feel like she's your best friend, right? Like you yes. know her. And uh, so I, I just always thought Jill was great. And, and I was speaking at the NSA conference. And Charlie, who brought me there, said to me, is there anybody you want to meet? It was my first NSA. Actually, I hadn't gone to NSA until five years ago. But I'd already was well into my career. And I said, well, if I could meet anybody dead or alive, it would be Gandhi, Amelia Earhart, and Jill Conrath. <laughs> he says to me, at least one of it worked out. <laughs> one of them is actually here. <laughs> and... Uh, he says, Jill Conrad's over there. We were at the bar. And I, I was like a little starstruck. It would be like Mick Jagger's over there, right? And I get, and I get to stand, and, and he says, do you want me to introduce you? And so I stand up. He says, you sit the, I won't use the word, you sit the bleep down. <laughs> I'm going to have her come to you. And I'm like, Ugh. So long story short, an hour later before she's going to bed, she says, hi, I'm Jill. I hear you wanted to meet me. She's got a glass of wine that's got that much wine left in it. And I said, I had to get that. And that was this courage point. And I said, oh, no, you sit down. We have a lot to talk about. Please order a bottle of this. <laughs> and I got a bottle of whatever she was drinking. Two and a half hours later, we had drinking the whole bottle of wine. Sorry, Jill, if you're listening. And we became buddies. And I said to her, listen, again, talking about Mick Jagger, I said, I know this is like asking Mick Jagger to sing at a birthday party, but I teach a, co a university course. Would you be willing to speak at my course? You know, in exchange, you know, I'd love to have you as my guest. I'm on the Sundance board, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, long story short, we became dear friends and she changed my life. She really changed my life and became uh, one of my greatest mentors and introduced me to Lori Richardson and Lauren Bailey and Colleen Stanley and all these women sales pros. And had I not had that moment of courage, no. it changed everything. And it can happen for anybody listening. Think like, what's the one thing, the one person that could really change your life? And, and once you start doing it, the world opens up. This is such great advice and really hands-on. Like, I think this is something... Yeah. You can hear and you can really implement it into your life right away. It's awesome, Sherry. It's really great. Um, I promise in the beginning we will get back to your your fails. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I think it also it fits super well to the whole topic because at least I myself I think it's really comforting um, to hear that even like the greatest uh, people in life have some fails <laughs> so maybe you can you can share your your biggest one or your favorite one <laughs> god there's so many i <laughs> could tell you about the time i got fired i could tell you about the time that i made a horrible investment or i could tell you about the time that um yeah probably one of those two let's take the first one because i think um that's unfortunately um a pretty relevant topic uh, for many people at the moment um so yeah let's take i've it never up. talked about this publicly i might get teary-eyed um i've never talked about this i was very young and rose up the corporate ladder very quickly in my early 30s i was started as a marketer uh became a salesperson and then had just gotten promoted. I was the youngest VP of sales and the only woman in the company. I'm not going to name the company. Yeah. Um, and I was on cloud nine. I mean, imagine you're 34 years old. 
making great, more money than I ever dreamed I could make. Like already like, you know, buying a home, a car. Um, again, I didn't go to law school. So, you know, I'm making my daddy proud, which was important to me. Um, and I tried a prank at a Christmas party. So this is in the early 90s, just to give some context. And I was actually getting a huge promotion to run um, all of sales and getting to move to Hawaii for a particular company, which was like, this is like a dream life, right? And somebody came to me with an idea for a prank at a Christmas party, which to me just sounded like kind of funny, but um, the way that the prank was, it had a little bit of a sexual connotation. And this was before people really knew about sexual harassment or there wasn't a lot of HR departments. It was new at that time, if you look at the history. Anyway, I thought it would be a funny joke. And so I said, yes. And one thing led to another. Everybody was laughing. They thought it was hilarious. There was obviously drinking going on at the Christmas party. And I was made as an example and the entire executive team, including me, got fired. And I was on my way to Hawaii for this company. I was on top of the world. Um, it was so devastating to me because yeah. me, my success came from the company. It didn't come from within. I don't think I had the confidence at that time to realize that you did this. It wasn't the company. You have this in you. And I was so, so depressed for a couple of months. And, but what I did write, everybody said, oh, you ought to file a lawsuit. You ought to do this. You ought to, you know, this, this isn't right. What I did write is I didn't buy into the anger and the negativity. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? This was my fault. I made a mistake. I shouldn't have known. And I'm not going to go after anybody or, you know, make it anybody else's fault. And then I realized that what I really wanted to do more than anything in the world was start a training company. And because I took the high road, everybody was like, oh my God, she shouldn't have gotten fired. She's so amazing. Da, da, da. And then I started my dream, which was my training company. And it gave me the opportunity and the freedom to go, I can do anything I want. And then everybody who had worked in this company became my clients. Like pretty soon they went out and I built my training company and it was the greatest thing that ever happened. So I guess, I, like I said, I've never talked about this publicly, but I guess I think what people need to realize is that, you know, there's this saying that everything happens for a reason. I don't know if we say it correctly. I think that when something happens, you need to find the reason. Mm -hmm. It doesn't find you and you've got to go, okay. I find myself furloughed. I find myself laid off. I can throw a pity party right now and I can blame the virus, the president, the incoming president, the this, the that. I can find blame. That's easy. You talk about the lazy way out, find blame. Yeah. You want to take the high road? Say now, what can I do to go forward? And that was the best thing that ever happened to me was getting fired. And yeah, I'm still I mean, friends. Yeah, everything happens for a reason. But I think if you're in such a situation, it's hard, especially in the beginning, um, to find find a reason behind everything and to stay optimistic and to stay motivated. Um, I think it's great uh, that you had the strength and to build a company. And I think there are hundreds and thousands of companies and sales reps out there that are really thankfully <laughs> that you got fired and you were able um, to build this great company and help them. Um, but yeah, it also shows what a strong person you are um, because I think not everyone has the strength um, to, to grow from such a setback, which is really amazing. I, I was depressed for a couple of months, trust me. <laughs> I was listening to very sad music. <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, um, you, you know, you, there, there is a time of mourning. You need to feel the pain. Um, you, you know, when something bad happens, you can't just go, oh, it happened. Like, we have to mourn. We have to honor um, the sadness and the emotion and the loss. And there's a lot of loss right mm -hmm. now. Um, but then there comes a time to pull it together and, and to have what I think is the most important quality of a seller or anybody who wants to be successful, and that's resilience. 
What does resilience mean? Resilience doesn't just mean bouncing back. Resilience means learning the lesson and getting stronger and better. That's what resilience is. Awesome. That is such a great closing remark, Sherry. <laughs> it really is. Um, yeah, I don't have any more questions. If you don't have any questions for me, or if you don't have anything on your heart, you still want, want to tell the world, um, I think it's a wrap. <laughs> awesome. Yeah.